Turn, if you would, in your Bible to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I'm going to read verses 1 through 5. You remember that Paul is speaking here about our human body. The present body we have, which is mortal, he calls it a tent. The future resurrection body, which is immortal, he calls a building. Let us hear the word of God and follow Paul's reasoning here in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 1. For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation which is from heaven, if indeed having been clothed we shall not be found naked. For we who are in this tent groan, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed, that mortality may be swallowed up by life. Now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God who also has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. Today we come to our third and final study on the subject, what God has prepared for our future. Thus far we have considered that first point, the knowledge that the Christian possesses. We reflected on the importance of our physical bodies in contrast to pagan Greek thought. We reflected on the difference and the comparison between our present mortal body and a future immortal body and our expectation regarding the future. Today we come to points two and three, the desire of the Christian who is well instructed, and number three, the assurance of the Christian regarding glorification. We begin then by reflecting upon the desire of the Christian who is well instructed. Paul uses the figure of clothing. He talks about this reception of this eternal, immortal body. He describes it in the language of being clothed upon with a garment. It will be a garment of garments, a more beautiful garment than you and I can imagine. You'll note what he says here in verse 2. He says, for in this we groan earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation which is from heaven. If you have come to Jesus Christ, you've made confession of sins, you embrace him as your savior, you receive him, you turn from your sins, you will have this experience at the second coming of being clothed with this habitation which is from heaven. The death of our present mortal bodies is portrayed in terms of being unclothed so that the soul being uncovered by the body is, as it were, naked. Verse 3, he says, If indeed, having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. He is saying that if a person is alive when the Lord returns and is clothed with this resurrection body, then their soul will never be found unclothed, that is, naked, as he puts it. Now, he makes some important statements in verse 4. He says, For we who are in this tent, this present body, grown, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed, that mortality may be swallowed up by life. He says he does not want to be unclothed. Now, in Philippians 1.23, Paul says that he had a desire... And there are two things to that desire. First, to depart, and secondly, be with Christ. Now, we can relate to that idea of departing from the problems in this life, the misery, the suffering, the sin of the world. You and I do have a desire to depart from these things. We would like to be in a place where there is no mob action, no disorder, no sense of people stabbing you in the back. We would like to depart from all of that sinful activity, and we would like to be with Christ. The very person who went to the cross, who laid his life down, who shed his blood in our place. But Paul, although he wanted those things, did not desire to die. That's very important. There's massive confusion upon that issue. 
He says no. He says in verse 4 that he did not want to be unclothed with the result that he would be found naked in verse 3. He did not want, he is explicit, he did not want his physical body to be removed from him, just like when you remove a piece of clothing at the end of the day. If your physical body is removed, your soul, as he puts it, is no longer covered, it is left naked. He did not want that experience. We need to take note that death is not a natural thing. Darwinian evolution says and maintains and assumes and presupposes that death is built from the beginning into nature. The Bible teaches just the opposite. No, death is abnormal. It is the judicial consequence of sin, Paul says, Romans 5.12, speaking about Adam, through one man, sin entered the world. You had the intrusion of sin through Adam, and what came with it? He says, our death through sin. If there had not been sin, there would have not been death. It was not the intention of God that there should be a separation of the human soul from the body. It was sin that brought this about. For the soul to be uncovered by the body is not a normal condition. And Paul did not want that to happen. His real longing, as he puts it here, was to be further clothed upon. He did not want to die. He wanted to be further clothed upon. Note verse 2. For in this we groan. He's talking about in this present earthly house, this tent, even in this body. He says in this, as we're living here with this mortal body, we groan, we sigh at times because of our afflictions. If you and I get sick, that is what happens. We sigh, we groan. Paul knew what that was. He says, for in this we groan, earnestly desiring. Now, what is his real desire? Is his real desire to die? He already said no. Earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation which is from heaven. In verse 1, he calls that a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. That was his desire. In verse 4, he repeats the language of being clothed upon. We want to be further clothed, he says. When Paul was in Rome, in prison, near the end of his life, he wrote to Timothy, 2 Timothy 4.13, he said, when you... When you come, bring the cloak which I left at Troas. Paul, in a cold, dark, damp prison, wanted a cloak to cover himself, to warm himself, so likewise he had a strong desire to put on the resurrection body without experiencing death. The believer who is well instructed takes the same view as Paul. Let's think about this, this putting on the resurrection body. I'm sure that we all would like to see improvements in our bodies, in our physical condition. You could probably list some things. Well, Scripture teaches those improvements are going to come. Jesus Christ will bring those improvements at the second coming. Now turn, if you would, for a moment, keep your hand there in 2 Corinthians 5, and just turn for a moment to 1 Corinthians 15, and notice with me, beginning at verse 50, where Paul makes the statement that our present bodies, and he calls these frail bodies, he uses the language of the rabbis, flesh and blood. We still have that expression, and you and I will say, look, I'm just merely flesh and blood. And we all know what that means. Well, that goes back to the rabbis. And Paul makes this statement in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 50, Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood, that is the way you and I now are in these frail bodies that you and I have, these mortal bodies that we have, our present mortality, these bodies, he says, flesh and blood, cannot inherit the kingdom of God. He's talking about the eternal kingdom of God at the end of history, the eternal state. It cannot happen. Something has to occur 
in order for us to enter that eternal kingdom with a body. Now, he says in verse 50, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. He uses one of his favorite words, musterion. A, I'm giving you a truth that was not clearly revealed in the past. He says, we shall not all sleep. There is no absolute certainty that all Christians will die. We already have indications of that fact in the Old Testament in terms of Enoch and Elijah, who never died. Well, we shall not all sleep. 1 Thessalonians 4.15, Paul refers to the fact that there are going to be those who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord. We're not all going to die. But there is something true of all of us. Believers in Jesus Christ, you've received Jesus Christ as your Savior. You're a saved man, saved woman, saved boy, saved girl. He says, we shall all be changed. He says it twice. Something is going to happen to our body. Now, he's very concise here in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 52. He says, when the king comes, there's going to be the sounding of a trumpet, which is appropriate. The king of kings, Jesus Christ, he says, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. Again, okay, so what is the change? Well, Paul draws attention to the fact that we are mortal. And that means we are corruptible. And we are always reminded of that in particular in the history of warfare. You remember from your days in school, I'm sure, the invasion of Russia by Napoleon in 1812. And there was one of the most significant battles in world history called the Battle of Borodino, 70 miles west of Moscow. Napoleon's forces, massive forces, versus the Russians, General Kutuzov. 68,000 men died in one day. And those bodies, the, the bodies were strewn across the battlefield. A dramatic reminder that we are mortal and those bodies were left there, and those bodies decayed. That's never going to happen again in the eternal kingdom. Why? What's going to happen? Notice verse 53. For this corruptible must put on incorruption. He's using the language and the imagery again of clothing. This corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. Great changes are going to happen. I've given to you on the back of the outline a tremendous quote from the great church father Augustine in his famous book, The City of God. Line 19 up from the bottom, Augustine, who was a bishop in what is today Algeria, right on literally a stone's throw from the Mediterranean Sea. Line 19, up from the bottom, he talks about uh, deformities. Now, in one sense, we all are deformed. In the sense that there are no perfect physical uh, specimens. We all are deformed. Physical and mental deformities are in us to one degree or another. In some cases, it's huge. In other cases, it's lighter. But that's going to change. Notice what he says, line 19 up from the bottom. Anything in that nature that is deformed, and of course, the sole purpose of the deformity is to give yet another proof of the penal condition of mortals in this life. So whenever you see a human deformity, it's a reminder that we are, going back to Genesis 3, under a divine penalty for sin, the sin of the representative head of the human race, Adam. Augustine says anything of this kind will be restored in such a way as to remove the deformity while preserving the substance intact. And then, as you know, the Romans, he was a Roman, 
were outstanding in the field of sculpture. And so what would happen if a human sculptor messed up in his work? He, Augustine says, an artist who has for some reason produced an ugly statue can recast it and make it beautiful, removing the ugliness without any loss of the material substance. And then, if you skip the sentence, notice the question. If a human artist can do this, and they can, they can recast the statue. If a human artist can do this, what are we to think of the almighty artist? Listen, if a human can do it, the almighty God can do this. So at the second coming, you and I will have no physical problems. We will be recast by God. These are amazing things. And it's going to happen at the second coming. And Paul talks about glorification, this recasting that will take place of our bodies. Paul uses the word glorification to describe this. And he says that there is assurance given to us by God regarding the fact that this will happen. First, we need to stop, as he says, to reflect on the fact that God alone is able to do this. You and I cannot do this. We cannot clothe ourselves with the garment of incorruption and immortality. All the money in the world cannot do this. The best hospital in the world cannot do this. And we are so thankful for our physicians and nurses who dedicate their lives as instruments of divine healing. Jesus spoke positively of even the physicians in the ancient world. And there were physicians in the Greek world going back to at least 500 B.C., Jesus said in Luke 5, 31, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. He acknowledged the place in common grace of human physicians. Paul took the same view, Colossians 4, 14. He refers to Luke, the beloved physician. We are so thankful for them, but they cannot clothe us with immortality and incorruption. Only God can do this. And Paul assures us that God will indeed clothe us with immortality and incorruption. We come back to 2 Corinthians 5. Note verse 4, he says, Mortality will be swallowed up by life. What an amazing description. He is describing the disappearance of mortality. A greater power overcomes mortality, and it is life from God which will totally eliminate mortality. Note those words, mortality will be swallowed up by life. And God has determined that this will happen. Note verse 5, now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God. There may be someone listening who is angry with God. Please understand this important truth. Jesus Christ died so that you may have eternal life. His resurrection is the proof of his future conquest of death. God stands on the side of eternal life. God is opposed to the permanence of mortality in his world. Always remember that mortality was an intrusion from without. And the devil intruded it. Jesus said he is the murderer. It was an intrusion into a perfect world. 
And God has announced that he will remove it. So this is the future aspect of our salvation. Again, the term is glorification. Has God given to us any assurance that all of these things are really, truly going to happen? Paul says yes. Note verse 5, 2 Corinthians 5.5, 5, God has given the Spirit. God has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. The word there in the Greek, arabona, can be translated down payment, first installment, deposit, or guarantee. This was a technical term in the ancient world. It was used in legal and commercial context to refer to the first installment that paid a part of the purchase price in advance. The deposit secured a legal claim to the item in question and it obligated the contracting party to make further payments. That is the word he uses there. Paul is saying, that God has given to us the first installment of our ultimate salvation. And that first installment is the Holy Spirit indwelling us. And now God has an obligation to finish what he has committed to. The Holy Spirit dwells in the body of the Christian. Now, what does he do in our lives anyway? Basil the Great, one of the most renowned theologians of the last 2,000 years, lived in the 4th century in the area of Cappadocia, which is Turkey. He asks a question. He says, what does the Spirit do? And then he makes a very short statement. He says, his works are ineffable in majesty cannot even speak hardly about this subject he is saying. Ineffable in majesty and innumerable in quantity. The bottom line is that the Holy Spirit makes beautiful people who look more and more like Jesus Christ. Paul says, Galatians 5, 22 and 23, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. May I ask you, how well are you doing? In bearing the fruit of the Spirit. Are you a man or a woman bearing the fruit of kindness or these other fruits? Paul is saying, on the basis of the wonderful ministry of the Spirit in making us into beautiful people, we ought to have no doubt that we shall receive everything else which God has promised to give us. The Spirit is the down payment. We shall be changed. Death will be swallowed up in victory. Now I'm going to end with Philippians 3. So turn over there if you would to Philippians chapter 3 and notice what's going to happen. Remember, this is glorification. Here's another description of glorification. This is the final thing God does in our salvation, and it happens to all of us at the same time. Philippians 3.20. Paul, it's interesting that he, as a Roman citizen, recognized that he had an even more important citizenship. You know, you could have a dual citizenship. A lot of people have that. You could be a citizen of the United States, in Norway or a citizen of the United States and Switzerland at the same time. It's possible to do that. 
Well, that is true of all of us. We have a dual citizenship. We're citizens of the United States. But most importantly, he says, notice Philippians 3.20, you have your open Bible there, for our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what's going to happen when he breaks through the clouds? Here it is. Who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. Two things happen. There's a transformation. The form is changed. Notice he refers to our present bodies, the flesh and blood, as our lowly body. Well, that will be transformed, and the end result is conformity to his glorious body. Jesus Christ's body also was changed when he was raised from the dead, and we will have all of the attributes found in the resurrection body of Jesus Christ, all of those attributes found in our body. This is amazing. So, in view of the blessing of glorification which awaits us, Paul continues his argument in chapter 4, verse 1. Remember, there are no chapter divisions in the original text. These are added about the year 1200. He continues his argument, and he says, Therefore, you see, in light of this transformation, and in light of this conformity and this, these wonderful things that are going to happen, he says, therefore. Now here you have the love of Paul. He loved those brethren in Philippi. What a beautiful thing is love. Let us excel in love. Let us be superlative in love. I want you to see chapter 4, verse 1 of Philippians. The language of love. My beloved, longed for, brethren, my joy, my crown, beloved. Two times he uses the word beloved. What is he saying in this passage where he expresses his deep affection? Notice what he says. Stand fast in the Lord. Whatever you do in the midst of the changes of life, and life is always in flux, it is not static. Whatever you do, Remain firm and steadfast in your faith in the Lord. Do not ever leave the Lord. He is saying, continue to place all of your trust in Christ. That God-man who shed his blood for sinners on the cross, who was raised from the dead, who ascended into heaven, who saves all who put their trust in him and who call upon him. Persevere, he says, in your attachment to the Lord Jesus Christ. 